Hello and welcome to Best of the Day from the 50th annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology in Chicago again this year. This is the 10th year, actually the 11th year, uh, that we've been bringing you these Best of the Day programs beginning back in New Orleans in 2004. And this is also my final year of doing these best of the day programs. So I have arranged to have some of our best faculty and some of my best friends available for this year's best of the day. And definitely included in that is Dr. Myron Churchman from the Roswell Park Cancer Institute. So Church, thanks so much for coming to the best of the day. It is always great to have you sit down with us and, and talk about uh, lymphomas and, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So, um, ASCO is not ASH, uh, so the hematologic malignancies are not nearly as prominent at ASCO as they are at ASH, but nonetheless, there were some very interesting presentations this year, and some of them we've been, you know, watching evolve over the years, and I think uh, everyone's aware of, of the uh, developments as far as the B-cell receptor signaling pathway is concerned in CLL and in lymphomas. It's been several years since Jonathan Friedberg presented the data with fostamatinib, uh, I believe at an ASH meeting a number of years ago, and, and that sick inhibitor has moved on and is now, I think, being looked at in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune disorders. But uh, another sick inhibitor uh, was discussed at this meeting, and this is a, a Gilead drug, GS9973, uh, that's being looked at in CLL. So um, tell us a little bit about sick inhibitors and how they differ from BTK inhibitors and PI3 kinase delta inhibitors, and what you think their potential role might be in CLL. I think that's an easier question uh, to ask than to answer. Only reason <laughs> is that I don't think we fully understand with the B-cell receptor pathway how these different targets may interact. Uh, what's believed and what, uh, from what I've read in the literature is that perhaps the sick is maybe further upstream from the B-cell receptor pathway, whereas the BTK inhibitors, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the Brutinib uh, identifies and targets. Um, you know, depending on who draws the cartoon depends where it's located. It is very unique, uh, but also with the PI3K delta isoform, uh, the inhibitors, they don't just work within the B-cell receptor pathway. There's other ways that they interact with the cell with respect to other, perhaps, other targeted pathways. So what's interesting is that one thing that was, I believe, presented uh, either yesterday or the day before was they were looking at a combination of their sick inhibitor as well as in combination with actually idelalisib. And what they found was that in, uh, in CLL that they saw a, a, a bad signal with a pneumonitis. The patients actually had uh, inflammation, which would have been unexpected. Maybe saying you're just targeting and, and you know, hypothesis, well, I'm gonna have a double signal within the B cell receptor pathway. But for some reason to which we still don't understand at this way, they're, still, they're looking into it is that there was a significant uh, patients were developing inflammation of the lung, pneumonitis, and at that point they've stopped the trial. They're not going to utilize the combination. No. As a single agent, however, that was tested in, oh, about 40, they actually had 44 patients on study, 27 are still on treatment, and about 40 out of 41 patients that were viable, 91% had reduction in tumor size. In addition to that, 64% uh, of the patients had an objective response, so greater than or equal to 50% shrinkage and adenopathy. And they saw, which was common, uh, a couple things. They saw the lymphocytosis, the peripheral lymphocytosis that we see with the B-cell receptor. It's typical for that type of agent and that pathway. And they also did see reversible grade three uh, elevation of transaminases in two patients. The other common side effects, which is not that uh, different than what we've seen say with the uh, idolicib with some diarrhea, fatigue, and uh, basically uh, fairly well tolerated, reversible toxicities. Where it's gonna play out, I'm not quite sure. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, one of the, one of the other drugs that has already been approved in uh, 
in CLL and in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is ibrutinib, which is the first BTK inhibitor to hit the marketplace. And there's a large phase three trial uh, presented at this year's meeting, the phase three resonate trial, right. um, looking at ibrutinib versus ofatumumab. Uh, one would expect that ibrutinib would come out the winner in that trial. Uh, how did that work out? You were correct. Your prediction was correct that uh, ibrutinib definitely had uh, more activity. What was interesting is that when ofatumumab was originally um, uh, approved for relapse refractory CLL, uh, much of its activity was based on improvement in clearing of the patient's peripheral lymphocytosis and marrow improvement and marrow function. It was interesting is that when we now put in adenopathy, uh, you know, and also make it a little more stringent with respect to following scans, is that we saw a dramatic difference in objective response rates, but essentially was 40% response rate, objective response with ibrutinib, and only 4.1% objective response with ofatumumab when we look at the entire patients, both nodal as well as their, their blood and marrow compartments. So idelalisib is being combined with rituximab, and yet most of the trials we've seen with ibrutinib have been single agent. Are, are the pharmacyclics people looking at combinations of ibrutinib with CD20-directed monoclonal antibodies? I believe those trials are actually uh, either ongoing or planned, and I think those are important. My, my feeling is that it is wonderful that we have an agent such as ibrutinib approved, but uh, my only concern is that, you know, continuing a single agent until progression may actually, one thing uh, financially is very expensive to do that. Second of all, I am also concerned that we may be actually uh, increasing the risk of development of resistance to the agent. Well, how that's going to turn out, it, there's some signals there, patients actually that in CLL, a lot of this work we've done at Ohio State uh, with John Bird's group, is that some patients actually, well, they demonstrated that the cells had uh, mutations in the actual bruton tyrosine kinase target. That may not be the entire you know, group of patients, but I think that it will be very important in the future that we use some of these best agents that we have in combinations, rationally combining them, but also making sure that we don't see any untoward toxicities, which we may not expect. Right. Right. Uh, some things just are unpredictable. Well, the other area besides B-cell receptor signaling, the other area that has been looked at is, uh, is the BCL2, BCLX, uh, pathways, and, and BCL2 is often overexpressed um, in, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and other B-cell disorders. Uh, several years ago, there were a lot of studies looking at uh, oblimersin or oblimersin, however you pronounce yeah. that drug, and that, uh, that just never seemed to work out. But now there are a number of other agents targeting uh, BCL2, and uh, this year there were a couple presentations looking at this uh, Abbott agent, AB199, also known as CDC0199, since they're Abbott and Genentech are working CDC, together. Right. So how does this, how does this, these agents differ from some of the earlier agents that targeted uh, BCL2, and uh, how active do these agents appear? It's quite dramatic, and we've spoken in the past where, with respect to these agents, um, when they initially were uh, put on market or being investigated when they were being uh, put in clinical trials, they actually saw dramatic tumor lysis syndrome. Could be somewhat dose dependent, and there were actually some deaths in patients at tumor lysis syndrome that uh, has actually required a big change. We're, we're participating in the clinical trial. Patients actually are admitted to the hospital when they begin ABT199. And the trial that we're doing in CLL is in combination also with obinutuzumab, the uh, GA101 antibody. But what I think what's important there is that the tumor lysis syndrome is a very strong signal of anti-tumor activity. Absolutely. And the way they work is that uh, basically we worked with oblomericin, oblim it's hard to pronounce as obatoclox. With obatoclox, basically a large signal was against the MCL1, which is an also another anti-apoptotic protein. The other one, BCL2, is important, but ABT263 was the, the previous uh, Abbott agent, was not only against BCL2, but BCLXL. 
B-cell, cell on platelets, right, and the dramatic thrombocytopenia would actually make it a problem if you're going to mix it with chemotherapeutic agents. And if you had mucosal breakdown, we could see maybe a lot of bleeding. You didn't see it as a single agent, but I thought it was a great that they actually proceeded now with a pure BCL2 inhibitor. And I think it's very exciting. We're seeing that with respect to a single agent in CLL, about an 80% objective response rate. And these are actually patients that have poor prognostic factors. Some of them in the single agent arm had both fludarabine resistance as well as um, they had uh, bad players. The 17P minus patients respond very nicely. And then in combination, what they're seeing is also around an 80% objective response rate, smaller number of patients, but they're seeing a higher number of complete remissions. So I think it's very exciting. We're gonna see a lot more of ABT199 in the future. We're just working out right now with the, the companies in Genentech and, uh, and basically Abbott is how to safely dose it, how to escalate it. And then once that's worked out, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of it in the future. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, lymphomas. And, and as long as we're talking about R-squared, um, there, there was an abstract uh, looking at the addition of uh, Revlimid or lenalidomide to R-CHOP um, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And they, they did a historical comparison with a population that, that got R-CHOP. So it wasn't a randomized study. It was more of an MD Anderson sort of study looking at a historical uh, population. But how well um, is this combination added? Um, all, the, all the other drugs are kept in the R-CHOP regimen. They didn't drop any. Uh, so when you add lenalidomide, do you run into a lot of myelosuppression, or how well is that combination tolerated? It's well tolerated, Jim, but you know we have to keep in mind that the patients, at least in this trial, did require Nulasta. There are patients that uh, don't have marrow involvement, they're young, you don't have to use growth factors and all, but in this trial, you did utilize that. It's not a uh, necessarily a, a game breaker, but uh, they did see neutropenia, but not so much, they didn't see problems with neutropenic fever. Uh, of interest, the, the dose that they utilized basically was the uh, 25 milligrams of lenalidomide days 1 to 10, every 21-day R-CHOP. Yeah, shorter course. Other people have looked at maybe giving a different dose, 20 milligrams, but it's still seeing the same signal, which is that you're seeing good activity. Now, what was the most important point is when we use R-CHOP up front, there's a difference when we look at different criteria. You can use the Hans criteria was using immunohistochemical staining to differentiate between the GCB, the germinal center B cell type, and the non-GCB, or most of those are going to be the activated B cell type. The, only, the very important point, I think, the take-home point with that study, though, is that with respect to those patients with the activated B cell type or the non-GCB, they appear to do just as well as the GCB. And historically, our CHOP, they're always going to do worse in upfront studies. So what's happening is the addition of lenalidomide is mitigating the negative impact of having a non-GCB phenotype on your large cell lymphoma tumor. I think it's very exciting. And so is this immunohistochemical process, the Hans algorithm, yeah. is this a very reliable way of differentiating GCB and non-GCB? Or yeah. do you really need to look deeper with gene expression studies? You know, that's very debatable, and that's an area of actual discussion in the field. Um, I would put it this way. If you actually have, most places will be able to do immunohistochemical sure. staining. Until we develop a very reproducible and an acceptable assay for gene expression profiling, and they are coming, those assays will be at a genetic level looking at patients who could have tumors sent to maybe a, a company and they'll come back and tell you it's a ABC or GCB. That's not quite ready for prime time for the, the community. So I think that, to be honest with you, I would, lie, I would probably prefer at least at the pathologist, at the, say, at the uh, oncologist uh, that he relies on, can actually easily do a Hans algorithm. You're correct, it is not <clears throat> as reproducible, but if it's done in good hands and in good material, it can be reproducible. But I think for now, it's good enough. And I'm not saying that right now everybody should be getting let a little might add it. It has to be further validated. There is also a number of trials looking at the same thing. We're doing a R chop versus R square chop, and we're in a intergroup study that's led by ECOG, and that's looking at all comers. Whereas 
companies are going to isolate out the non-GCB only, but you know, I don't think we're hurting the patients with GCB, we're just helping the ones that are non-GCB. Is, is that study stratified for um, GCB versus non-GCB? It's going to be stratified, it's going to be looked at, but right now the signal looks like it's going to be mostly in the, the non-GCB patients. Very good. All right. So there was another, another study looking at um, RCHOP versus a variation of RCHOP, but this was in mantle cell lymphoma, older patients who were not the best candidates for stem cell transplants, and they substituted bortezomib for vincristi. Probably not a good idea to give them both together exactly. because of the neuropathy. So bortezomib's been around for a while. It's approved for mantle cell lymphoma in the relapse state. Um, does the addition of bortezomib to the, the CHOP backbone, the R-CHOP backbone, make a difference? There was more toxicity. And in fact, my recollection is I actually saw more in the way of cytopenias, including uh, thrombocytopenia, including patients needing platelet transfusions. Uh, of interest is that the complete remission rates were a little bit better. There was 41% with the RCHOP, and the, when you take the, replace the vincristin with the bortezomib, there was around a 48% uh, basically objective response for CR rate, I'm saying. So you had a higher CR rate. You actually had a, almost a doubling or so of the median progression-free survival from 14 months to around 25 months. They did not see a major change, though, in overall survival. I think because depending on the patients and the responses, you know, they had salvage therapies for the patients. But I think it just shows us a signal that, um, that proteasome inhibitors are very important. They are approved with respect to the treatment of mantle cell relapse, perhaps in, in patients, especially accepting that toxicity is increased. If the outcomes can be proven that in, in say, further studies and increasing the numbers of patients, that may be a new way of treating patients. We know that our CHOP compared to CHOP is not great without any further therapy as an induction therapy in mantle cell. So I think it's easy to beat. beta muscine rituxin is probably better than our CHOP based on the work by Rummel et al. that we know. Right. And then the only question is, who knows how this would play out if we would have given patients, the elderly patients, two years of rituxin maintenance. So I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. Just I think there's a signal there that Velcade is active in mantle cell, and by taking it and replacing vincristin, we can amplify a little bit more of the anti-tumor activity. Very good. Well, we'll wait and see what happens. There, it'll be interesting to see whether there are studies being done with some of the newer proteasome inhibitors, carfilzomib, or some of the oral agents that are coming down the line. Actually, very interesting you mentioned that. We didn't talk about this before, but we're running actually a very large phase two carfilzomib-rice combination trial in transplant-eligible patients, different than this study, based on a lot of work that we've done in the translational work in the laboratory with my colleagues, which actually showed that carfilzomib, which is a irreversible inhibitor of the proteasome, actually in combination with drugs that are including rituximab and, and, and also cisplatinum, et cetera, showed some actually very good additive, if not synergistic activity, and also in patient samples. So now we're gonna be testing that right now with the, the protocol is open at Roswell. Very good, that will, be, that will be very interesting. Well, the other area that I want to ask you about is that of the antibody drug conjugates. We're seeing more and more presentations and clinical trials, not just in hematologic malignancies, uh, but also in solid tumors. Uh, the TDM1 breast cancer drug is, is now FDA approved for, uh, for metastatic breast cancer. And we have uh, brentuximab vidotin uh, for Hodgkin's disease and, and ALK positive lymphomas. But now there are a number of drugs that have been discussed at this year's meeting uh, targeting CD19 and, and some other surface markers. So why, why CD19? The Seattle Genetics has the, the drug SGN CD19A, I yeah, think it's called. It is. Why CD19 as opposed to CD20? I think that's a very good question, Jim. I mean, the, you want an agent, you want an antibody that when it binds to its target, it internalizes. So the whole idea here is that you take a very toxic agent, a very strong drug, that you could not inject into the patient's body itself. It would be too high of toxicity, it would be too damaging. So what you do is that you, the linker technology and biotechnology, linker technology made it that you can take an antibody, and in this way, an internalizing antibody, CD19, 
CD22, CD79B, CD30. And with the linker, you put on a very, very toxic agent, but you make sure you deliver it predominantly to the tumor cell, not to the overall, you're not infusing it all through the body. So these are mainly mitotic poisons of the- Essentially, uh, they're all mitotic poisons. They're, they're gonna lead to G2M arrest and also apoptosis. And also the peripheral neuropathy is seen with respect to the MMAE, the combination with the monomethyl aristatin E, as we see with respect to, as you mentioned before, the brintuximab vidotin, but also what was mentioned uh, this meeting today, there was a combination of CD79B or the CD22, two different internalizing antibodies in combination with MMAE and in combination with rituximab. So a drug immunoconjugate with rituxin, they'd looked at, actually it was a randomized phase two, and the bottom line there is that it appeared that there was a little higher CR rates in follicular lymphoma patients with the 79B drug immunoconjugate than with the CD22. So if they're already targeting an internalizable yes. surface molecule, um, why add another monoclonal antibody that, that targets a, a surface molecule that does not internalize? Um, you know, why not combine it with a drug of a different mechanism? Well, Jim, I think that all those are possibilities, are all realistic, and they're probably going to be done. If not, they're being done now. I do like the idea, though, of, of using a drug immunoconjugate and also a cold antibody. And the reason for that is that there's plenty of targets on the normal but also on the neoplastic malignant B cell, the lymphoma CLL cells. So if we're relying on unique mechanisms of killing, so you have, say, a CD20 antibody, and we can also look and discuss, you know, there's second generation. Some do better complement-dependent cytotoxicity. Some do better ADCC. That if you utilize that, you're getting the benefit of the antibody bringing in the immune system to attack the cell. At the same time, you're using chemotherapy, but the chemotherapy has less nonspecific toxicities because it's being delivered to the tumor cell. I think it actually is very valuable and I think that it's something that I've been interested in for many years, is that the combination of unique mechanisms of action to kill the tumor cells. So there is some logic, and it makes sense. Hypothesis is that you're going to do better with a cold antibody and a drug-conjugated antibody. So this, this uh, Seattle Genetics uh, drug conjugate had a rather unusual and surprising uh, adverse event profile. And tell us a little bit about this microcystic keratopathy that was seen with this agent. That was very interesting, and it was, uh, there's, the individuals, there were about 25% of patients had some blurred vision, and they investigated, and they presented at this meeting uh, today, just today, that they had this, as you mentioned, these small cysts would develop on the cornea, and then as the patients continued therapy, they would become more central, and then the visual field would be actually uh, impaired. And what was interesting also is that they could utilize, uh, actually, steroid eye drops to improve that, but kind of strange because yeah. CD19 is not within the eye. They tested that. Yeah. You know, why would that be? There's things that we don't understand, as we were saying earlier, but the interesting thing is the question is that it has good activity, and with respect to that, as well as the other CD19, which was, uh, I can't pronounce it. You may be able to pronounce it. This was called SAR3419. Oh, right, the, yeah, the Sanofi drug, or the, yeah. right. It, with respect to that CD19, which was presented, that actually had uh, CD19 antibody with mitansinoid conjugate, the DM4, that also had some... Uh, yeah, the coltuximab rav ravtansine, yeah. You can say that <laughs> three times quickly, I can't. With respect to that agent, also, there was activity in about 40% of patients, which I thought was very important because the majority of patients with not only the Seattle Genetics drug, most of them were diffuse large B-cell patients, and the one that we just mentioned, the Sanofi, Sanofi drug, was only in relapsed refractory large cells. To see about a 40% objective response rate with some, um, some CRs, I think is very interesting and exciting. The eye issue, I think, is doable. They, the, the, the comment was made, perhaps prophylaxing patients that are going to go on the, basically, SGN CD19A with steroid eye drops and continue, might be able to, and the, the, essentially the eye um, toxicity is reversible. Most of the patients are going back to grade one. I think it's going to be an exciting adjunct, and I think we're going to have to see how we're going to be combining it, as you said, not just with other antibodies, with biologics, but in large cell lymphoma, 
other active agents in relapsed large cell. And the other two agents, the, the CD19B direct, the polituzumab and, yes. the, and the CD22 right. pinituzumab. Right. Uh, so it looks like the, um, the CD19B directed antibody is going to be 79B. moving. 79B. 79B yeah. is going to be moving forward in, in the clinical trial process. Yeah. I, from what I could see is that the, the data is that the activity was similar with respect to objective response rate, but there was a stronger signal, meaning that there was a higher number of complete remissions with the 79B conjugate versus the CD22. Therefore, I guess the decision was made they're going to pursue the 79B conjugate. This whole field of the stealth uh, drug uh, Antibody drug conjugates is really interesting and, yes. uh, and certainly makes sense and I think is going to, uh, going to be utilized in a lot of other fields besides just the, the B cell disorder. So that's great. So, Chuch, yeah. thank you very much. I have it's to been, thank you for all the years. And, uh, it's and been a great you. ride. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm going to enjoy retirement. You know what? You deserve it. Thanks, Take buddy. Care. All right. All right. And thank you and thanks all of you for watching this segment of Best of the Day from the 50th Annual meeting the American Society of Clinical Oncology in Chicago. We will be back later this week with many more Best of the Day presentations, so be sure to check back with us. Thanks again.